theme of the sermon is the pattern of being a hard worker, the pattern of being a hard worker. What I'm going to do is basically go through these 15 verses, and we're going to see just a couple points from Jacob in his life where he's working very hard. And then we're going to make applications with three points at the end of the sermon after I go through these verses. But let's just start at verse number one. And it says, Then Jacob went on his journey and came into the land of the people of the east. And he looked, behold, a well in the field, and lo, there were th three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks, and a great stone was upon the well's mouth. And thither were all the flocks gathered, and they rolled the stone from the well's mouth, and watered the sheep, and put the stone again upon the well's mouth in his place. So Jacob is traveling, and then they come to this well with water, which obviously water is not as, as accessible back then as it is today. So basically you would go to a specific location to basically water the animals, get water for the people, and things such as that. Verse 4, And Jacob said unto them, My brethren, whence be? And they said, Of Haran are we? And he said unto them, Know ye Laban the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. Now remember, basically Jacob is sent away to basically find a wife, right? And he's looking for Laban, he's looking for the relatives of his mom, and then basically trying to marry a, of those people. And so he asked about Laban, and they said, We know him. And he said unto him, Is he well? And they said, He is well. And behold, Rachel, his daughter, cometh with the sheep. And of course, Rachel is the person that Jacob is going to basically fall in love with. And Rachel, his daughter, the daughter of Laban, is coming. Verse 7, And he said, Lo, it is yet high day, neither is it time that the cattle should be gathered together. Water ye the sheep, and go and feed them. And they said, We cannot, until all the flocks be gathered together, until they roll the stone from the well's mouth, then we water the sheep. And what Jacob is basically saying in verse number 7 is, is just like, why are we sitting here doing nothing, right? Can't we do something? Why are we just sitting here and just talking and wasting time? I know in America, there's always a joke about construction workers where basically, you know, you have uh, one person working and then four people are basically holding a shovel. If only you could create a shovel that just stood up on its own and you wouldn't have to pay four people to just stand there doing nothing, right? But basically, this is what's going on. They're just kind of sitting there doing nothing. And they have an excuse in verse 8. They say, well, we can't do this until the flocks are gathered together. And it says, till they roll the stone from the well's mouth. What they're basically saying is it's somebody's job to roll this stone away, right? Now, the question would be, who cares? Why don't you just do it yourself, right? You're sitting there and waiting. Instead of waiting for somebody who maybe is late to do their job or whatever to roll the stone away, why not just do it yourself, right? I mean, it's, it's not like you have to wait for them to do it. You can roll the stone away. And he's, he's asking them this because he's just sitting here and he's like, why are we doing nothing, right? And some examples and applications you can make from this is, you know what, if you work at a company, you know, every once in a while you'll have basically the opportunity where you can do somebody else's job for them because you have dead time or whatever, or there's something that needs to be done, whether it's like, you know, print something for them or copy it, and they, even if they don't ask. And the thing is, instead of just sitting there doing nothing, why not just help out? You say, well, I'm not going to do that because it's not my job. I'm not paid for it. Who cares? Right? It's like, why have the attitude, well, I'm not going to do it because it's not my responsibility. In this example, there is no reason why they do not roll away the stone. Because they're sitting there, they're fully capable of doing it. It is a bad attitude to say, well, it's not my job. I'm not getting paid for it, so I'm not going to do it. That is a bad attitude to have. And in marriage, you can have this as well, where basically, you know, in general, there's going to be kind of defined roles of things that you do. But here's the thing. As a husband, if I have extra free time, it's not that big of a deal to me to just kind of help out my wife with something, whether it be to help out with the dishes, help out with the kids. It's just like, to me, I'm just like, if I have extra free time and I'm able to, and it's going to help her, why not? Right? For me personally, and you know, not everybody sees it exactly like I do in this way, but let me say that I believe that all men should know how to change diapers and things such as that. I mean, it's just not that I'm going to be the one doing it all the time and not that I enjoy doing it, but I do know how to do it. I don't enjoy it. I never like it when those moments come up, but let me just say this, especially once you have like three kids, it's, it's pretty difficult because sometimes there's multiple kids that need attention at the same time. And it's just like, I'm not going to be like so old fashioned where it's like, well, that's not my job to help. So I refuse to help. It's like, you know what? I, I do believe that yes, in defined roles and old fashioned roles, but I also believe we can go to too, too big of extremes to that. And some of the examples you can look at is, and I think we're going to look at it later, but with the virtuous woman, some of the things she does in Proverbs 31 are men's work when you really look at it. And it's not that she's, you know, basically, you know, 
becoming a man or whatever, but she has the opportunity to help her husband in some areas, and a godly wife is going to do that. And a godly guy would do the same thing as well. So yes, I do believe in traditional roles, but I do think we can go to, to too big of extremes with that. Okay? And so in marriage or in companies, there's these examples. Or what about with children? Sometimes you have multiple children, and one child makes a mess, and the other child doesn't. You tell the kids, clean up the mess, and here's the thing. What does one of the kids say? I'm not the one who made the mess. And as a dad, it's kind of like, I really don't care who made the mess. What I care about is there's a mess, and it needs to be cleaned up, and dad ain't going to do it. Because I'm teaching you kids that basically when you make a mess, you got to clean it up. Right? And look, I get it. It can be frustrating if it's like somebody else did it, but it's just like, you know, I have to clean it up. But that's just the way it works. The reality is we need to have the pattern of being a hard worker. We're basically, when we have the opportunity to step in and work hard, it's like we take that opportunity. And see, in this story, you've got these men that are basically saying, well, we're sitting here and waiting. It's like it's not our fault. It's not our job to roll away the stones. So that's the reason why we're waiting, Jacob. Verse number nine. And while he yet spake with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. And it came to pass when Jacob saw the daughter, the Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Now, there's a lot of things we can learn from this. One thing on a side point, I do think there is something pretty specific as when he saw Rachel, he rolls away the stone. It's called impressing somebody that you find attractive. Right. And you know what? Every guy, when they're single, will go to great extremes to do foolish things to try to impress women. That's just the way it is. And we see it here. There's nothing new under the sun. We see it with Jacob here. But I do believe he was planning to roll away that stone anyway. I don't think it's but I, I think there's kind of a dual application because it's specific when he saw Rachel. But, you know, I used to misunderstand this story because I used to think of it as like these other men were not able to move away the stone and Jacob was able but when you really think about it, I'm sure Jacob being a hard worker was strong, but he's not going to be stronger than like three or four men put together, right? It's not a matter of that they were not able to do it. It's that they chose not to do it. If one man can roll away the stone, surely a group of men could roll it away. Because it's not like any of these people were like spending their time in a gym back then. I mean, they got strong from hard work. So three guys are going to be stronger than one guy or however many guys it is right? It's just like, you know, a group of guys are going to be able to roll away the stone. It's not that they were unable to do it. It's that they were unwilling to do it because they said, it is not my job. And then they basically get left it to somebody else. And Jacob is like, why are we sitting here? I don't want to sit here doing nothing. And he just rolled it away himself. Verse number, verse number 11. Verse 11, and that's the first instance of Jacob working hard. Verse 11, and Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. Now, I think it goes without saying that when he kissed her, this is basically like a normal greeting in that society. It's not like he grabbed her and then he's like, oh, I find her attractive. Let me just grab her and, you know, just, you know, it's just like a greeting. And, you know, obviously in some societies they greeted by kissing and they do that today in some societies. I'm glad I do not live in one of those societies because... To be honest, I would find it weird to greet a guy and then just kiss on the cheek, kiss on the cheek. But some cultures do that. I, to me, the handshake or the fist bump is perfectly okay with me, right? But it goes without saying that in verse 11, when he kisses her, it's just a normal greeting. It's the same greeting he would have given to a guy, okay? Verse 12, and Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's brother and that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. It came to pass when Laban heard the tidings of Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him. And so once again, he's kissing Jacob. So obviously you're seeing it's a normal greeting and brought him to his house. And he told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, surely thou art my bone and my flesh. Now we're going to see later on with Laban. I believe Laban has some character flaws when it comes to money, but I'm not saying he's a, a horrible person either. And, you know, he says that surely thou art my bone, my flesh. And what he's saying is that basically, you know, you're my relative. Okay. You've come all this way. You're in, in, and in today's world, if you're going to go visit a location, you go to Expedia or TripAdvisor or whatever. It's like, let me find an Airbnb. Let me find a hotel. Let me see where the restaurants are. It's not like it was like that back then. You're traveling by faith, you know, largely. You don't know what you're going to run into. 
And so once he sees his nephew, I mean, he would have been a horrible person if he doesn't warmly greet him. If he's like, oh, that's cool, well, I'll see you later. It's like, well, where's he going to go? You know what I mean? It's like, of course he should embrace him. And he does. You know, he does a respectful thing. I don't believe Laban's a great guy. He's going to show character flaws later. I don't think he's a horrible person either, though. And it says there, and he abode with him the space of a month. And what the idea was is Laban said to Jacob, you're here on this journey. You're going out by faith doing this. You're allowed to stay with me for free. You'll have a place to stay. You'll have food to eat. Basically, Jacob is on a one-month vacation, right? I mean, and you know, it makes sense. It, you know, he's seeing his uncle who's, who's never met him, and his uncle's like, wow, this is so exciting. Probably wants to hear stories about Rebecca, right? And he's like, hey, you know, stay with me. You know, just spend time and visit. And he's staying with him for a month. Then it says this in verse 15. And Laban said unto Jacob, because thou art my brother, shouldest thou there serve me shouldest thou therefore serve me for not now look he's he's there for a month and he's basically got an all expenses paid vacation for at least a time period right and he's there for a month and the next verse tells us laban says to jacob shouldest thou therefore serve me for not should you serve me and get nothing out of it what is laban saying he's saying I gave you a place to stay. You've been working for free for a month. I didn't ask you to work. You're serving me for not. You're serving me and I'm not paying you. And what you're seeing in that verse is that although Jacob had a place to stay and he didn't have to pay for anything, he had food provided, he didn't just sit there and do nothing. For that month, he was serving Laban. He was working. He was acting like one of his workers. Of course, during this time period, you know, what you're seeing is that when you would work at a company or whatever, you would often live at their big lot or whatever and then work for them full time. And their owner would pay for your food and your stay. And so Jacob is getting that anyway without having to work. But he has the attitude, you know what? I don't want something for free. It's like I feel obligated as I'm getting a place to stay. I want to chip in and help. And what you're seeing is Jacob is a hard worker. And he says, shouldest thou therefore serve me for not? Tell me. What shall thy wages be? Imagine you worked at a job for a month and you did such a good job that your boss is like, you know what? I, I want to make sure that you stay at this company. What do I need to pay you to get you to stay? Right? Usually you don't have that bargaining power as an employee because realize Jacob doesn't necessarily have a long-term plan. Laban doesn't know if he's going to stay or not, but Laban's seen over the course of the month, hey, this is a good worker. I want Jacob to stay with me. And he's like, what shall thy wages be? What do I have to pay you? I want you to be one of my employees. It's like, you'll have a place to stay. You'll have food to eat. What do I have to pay you to get you to stay? Right? What we're seeing is Jacob was a very hard worker. I want to give you three points here in this sermon of basically being a hard worker. Three points. Now go to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes 9. I believe sermons like this are always helpful and edifying because all of us can work harder. All of us can be reminded of things we know. And I would say that in today's world, people don't generally work that hard. We live in a culture where, honestly, we don't have to work that many hours to provide our needs. We don't have to spend you know, time going to a well to get our water to make sure that we don't die. I mean, it's like things are a lot easier. There's grocery stores and all these modern conveniences. There is a lot less time. We have a lot of leisure time. We have a lot of time to do games and have fun. And look, there's nothing you know, necessarily wrong with that. I mean, I think it's good to have fun and games. I'm glad as a church we're able to have fun you know, doing fellowship and stuff like that. But we need to be reminded of the fact that we're kind of blessed to have extra free time. And instead of getting this idea that we're just going to sit here and do nothing all the time, realize that we could actually work and accomplish something. Bible says in Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10, what, and point number one is this, we should work everywhere. We should have a habit of working everywhere. It says in Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. And basically, whenever you find something to do, do it with all your strength. I mean, Jacob went to the stone and it's like, I found something to do, literally with his hands. And it's like, all right, I'm going to roll that stone away. You say, why? Because it was something that needed to be done. 
and he just decided to do it himself. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. And the idea is that, you know, when we pass away, we're not going to be able to accomplish any work. We might as well do it now while we're alive. Go to Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. Proverbs chapter 31. You know, I, I'm one of these people, and I don't know, I guess people might consider this weird or whatever, but sometimes I'm at public places and I'll see like a trash can or whatever, and there's trash on the ground near the trash can, but it's not in the trash can. And you know, sometimes I will just like spend, you know, a couple minutes and pick up the stuff right around it. I mean, it drives me crazy. Why don't you just throw it in the trash can? And you say, why would you do that, Brother Stucky? Well, if I have a couple free minutes doing nothing, I might as well. Right? I mean, why just sit there and do nothing? I mean, if I, for, you know, you're waiting for somebody to come, you got five free minutes, I mean, accomplish something if you can. Now, look, sometimes there might be nothing to do. We understand that. But if you find something to do, do it. Right? I mean, you don't have to just sit here doing nothing. If there's something to accomplish, let's do it. Right? We should work everywhere that we go. It says in Proverbs 31, verse 12, referring to the virtuous woman, she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She, looketh, she seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ship. She bringeth her food from afar. And so the, here's the example of the woman who's basically going to a distance to make sure she gets the proper deals and the best prices on food. She bringeth her food from afar, the Bible says. She riseth also out as yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. And so look, the template for a godly woman of what she should strive to be is basically waking up early in order to provide food for a household. It says in verse 16, she considereth a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands, she planteth a vineyard. And it says she considereth a field and she buyeth it. Now, I don't believe that she's buying this field. This is just obviously an example of a woman. I don't believe she's buying this field and not telling her husband about it. I obviously believe that the husband at the end of the day is the head of the home, so he's going to be aware of this. But the idea would be if the husband's out working all day and basically you're trying to you know get a lot or get something it's like she might have the time to basically look at the field consider prices talk to him about it or whatever and she can put in that time and effort okay and i do believe this kind of crosses over with roles where she's helping out her husband with the fruit of her hand she planted the vineyard now technically you might consider that you know man's work but once again i think we can go a little bit overboard saying man's work and woman's work or husband's work and wife's work because basically if she has extra time why not plant a vineyard right i mean if you got a backyard and you got you know grass and an area to do it it's like why not if you have the extra time why not do that right you know you're accomplishing something you're going to get food from it she girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms and what you're seeing is if you define this woman you would say she's a hard worker masipak right and everywhere she's going, in all areas, she is working hard. Go to verse 27. Verse 27. Verse 27. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. So basically what she's doing is she's working hard to provide for her family and take care of them, and eateth not the bread of idleness. And what that's symbolically stating is she's not sitting around doing nothing, right? In our modern day, it's an epidemic of, it, it's, it's the social media generation. And any one of us can get sucked into this thing, but there will be people that will literally be on their cell phones for like five hours a day and just be on Facebook for hours and social media for hours and hours, accomplishing nothing. Now, here's the thing, obviously people are in different situations, but let me just say this, that in Proverbs 31, you have very traditional roles that are being linked, especially during that time period. And you're seeing a stay-at-home mom. Here's the thing. If you're a stay-at-home mom, that does not mean you just stay at home and do nothing. It's not like, well, you know what? I'm going to be godly, so I'm not going to go out and work, so I'm just going to sit at home and just do nothing and be on my phone all day. Well, that kind of defeats the purpose. The purpose is there's a lot of work to accomplish, and you can be a great help to getting that stuff done. But whether you're a husband or a wife, you should work hard. Husbands go out, they work their jobs, work hard at that job. Wives, you know what? Work hard, whether it's a secular job or at home raising the kids. Whatever your hand your finds to do, do it with your might. 
whatever it is, you know, work harder, whatever you do. Don't develop this attitude. It's like, oh man, I got to do more stuff. You know, it's just like life is about hard work. You accomplish nothing unless you work hard. That's just the way it is. Look at verse 31. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Let her own works praise her. Basically, when you work hard, there's going to be accomplishments. People are going to see it and she's going to get praised. Why? Not because she's the most beautiful woman in the world. Not because, you know, she's the smartest, but she works hard. And you can see the proof is in the pudding, as they say, right? And look, whether you're a husband, a wife, your parents, children, you know, wherever you go, work hard. How about a church? You know, at church, sometimes there's stuff to do, right? We get done with the services and, you know, we don't have a whole lot to do at our church, but there's still some basic stuff. Basically, setting up the tables, bringing them down, cleaning up basic stuff. You don't want to have this attitude, well, it's not my job. I mean, why would you have that attitude? Right? It's like, who cares whose job it is? It's like all of us can chip in and make things a lot easier. It's just like, why not? And, you know, the reality is when we do events, you know, because we do like to do events here from time to time, the, the, the events are great, but the one bad thing about them is they cause a mess. Right? And look, I get it. You know, I'm not saying everyone has to stick around so everything's perfect or whatever, but I'm just saying, you know, we can all be willing to try to help out. And at the very least, I, I believe there should be this attitude that, you know what, I'll, I'll clean up my own mess. You know what I mean? I've always had the attitude that basically, or I, I was taught this as a kid, that basically, if you make a mess, you clean it up. And the idea, leave a place better than when you came, right? So if you make a mess, you clean it up. So for example, you know, if your kids make a mess, it's like if Zeph makes a mess, if Christabel makes a mess, if Ezra makes a mess or whatever, it's like I should strive to have the ability to clean that up, me and my wife, and basically take care of our own kids because you don't want to just leave all the responsibility on one person. That's, that's not fair to people. As a church, we should be willing to chip in. And here's the thing, as our church grows, if we don't have a volunteering mentality, it's going to be a disaster. You know, we're not going to be doing as many activities and we won't be able to because there'll be so much stress just cleaning up basic stuff. We want to develop a volunteer mentality while our church is small. So when we get bigger, that will basically just pass on to future people. Because look, if you're new to a church, you don't really know what to do. You don't want to step on anyone's toes or whatever. But if you see other people working and you're a hard worker, your natural thing is, hey, is there anything that I can do to help? right now sometimes the answer to that's going to be no but sometimes the answer is yeah you know what can you help me do this and then basically as we get new people here people can just develop that volunteer mentality whether it's in your personal life or whatever it is it's like we should strive to work hard soul winning i mean that's something that we work hard right go to malachi 1 malachi 1 malachi 1 number one we should strive to work everywhere Wherever you are, you know, basically just be in this mindset. Is there something I can do to help? Right. You know, work everywhere. Right. But also, number two, be willing to work without getting credit for it. Be willing to work without getting credit. Don't have this attitude. Well, what's in it for me? It's a bad attitude to have. Be willing to work without getting credit. Now, Malachi 1, last book of the Old Testament, we're going to see the example which we can tie to church, which I was just talking about. It says in verse 10, Malachi 1 verse 10, Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? Neither do you kindle fire on my altar for naught. And what the Lord's rebuking them about is there's no one even willing to shut the doors unless they get credit for it, for naught, for no reason. Right? There's no one willing to kindle fire on my altar. Now, of course, we don't have an altar to kindle fire. So you got to be realize it's not the direct thing. But basically, is there anyone among you that would be willing to set up chairs or basically stack them for not? Where you're not getting credit, you're not getting paid. And the idea is you should be willing to volunteer even if you're not getting paid for it. I mean, this idea was just like, you know what, I'm not going to do it unless I get paid. And I will say this, that I, one thing I was told early on out here in the Philippines is in Baptist churches specifically, there can be this sort of mentality where basically... If you volunteer for something, you automatically get paid for it, 
where basically, you know, you get paid a certain amount and people have this attitude where, oh, I'll do this because I'm going to get paid. That's a bad attitude. That's not how we operate. And here's the thing. We do a lot of activities. We charge nothing. We do activities. We have fun. We get food. We get games. We do a lot of things for free. But here's the thing. It, I, I believe in volunteering and being willing to do that without getting paid for it. You say, why? Because that's what we see in Malachi 1 verse 10. And just inside of your heart, you shouldn't be, have this attitude, I will do something if I get something for it. If not, I'm not going to. Right? And, you know, shutting the doors is the idea of just like, kind of like closing up the church. So opening the church, closing the church, basic stuff like that. If we had a baptistry, you could think of maybe setting up the baptistry, putting water in it or whatever. We have a big event with visitors or whatever, just doing something simple. And it's just like the, the idea and the problem in Malachi 1 is people wanted to get paid. They wanted to get something out of it. They said, we're not going to do it unless we get something. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts, neither will I accept an offering at your hand. Go to Matthew 9, Matthew chapter 9, Matthew 9. And look, I'm not saying we have a problem with this at our church. We're just going through Genesis 29. We're seeing hard work and how we can apply it and something for us to be reminded about. With soul winning, we're working without getting any credit. You know, we don't get anything for going soul winning, right? We don't go soul winning to benefit ourselves. We go soul winning to benefit other people. It says in Matthew 9, verse 35, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they were faint and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth labors into his harvest. Now why is it that there's few laborers willing to do the work? I'm going to turn this off. We've got to because of the echo. But why is it that there's few people willing to do the work? Okay. Well, because they don't get anything for it. When we go soul winning and try to get people saved and give the gospel, we don't get paid for it. We don't get any credit. And look, it's like that at most churches where basically few people go soul winning. Now at our church, it's not really like that. We have the majority of people at our church go regularly soul winning. But at most Baptist churches, most people do not go soul winning. But let's say at those Baptist churches, they set up a system where they said, you know what, we'll pay you 100 pesos per hour for soul winning. There's probably a lot of people that will go soul winning. Why? Because they're getting something for it. But what a bad attitude to say, I'm not going to go soul winning because I get nothing out of it. Right? It's like we should be willing to do it volunteering and saying I'm doing it without getting paid. I mean, you should look at it and say, hey, you know what? I was able to lead someone to the Lord. That's a big enough reward to me, right? I'm excited when I get people saved. And here's the thing. That does not benefit me in my life, right? Because it benefits them. But here's the thing. I'm already going to heaven. I've done soul winning before. And I've had people ask me this question like, why do you do this? Like, why are you out here talking to people about this? And they basically say it in a way where it's like they feel like I'm doing it to, to help myself earn my way to heaven. I say, I'm going to heaven no matter what I do. I'm not doing this for myself. I'm doing it for other people. And I said, the reason why is I don't want people to burn in hell. That's the reason why. I don't want to see anybody go to hell. That's why I go and talk to people about it. I'm not doing it for something for myself. I'm doing it for other people. Go to Matthew 20. Matthew 20. Matthew chapter 20. And in Matthew 20, look at verse number 20. The Bible reads, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on thy left, in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You know not what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. And he saith unto them, Ye shall indeed drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. 
But a sin on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared to my father. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. But Jesus called them on to him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. And what Jesus is saying in verse 25 is, In this world, those that are powerful flaunt their power. But he said, it's not so among you. Those that are great amongst us, they don't basically just live this life of luxury where they're basically being served by everybody else. He said, it's the opposite. In this world, the powerful people are served by others. But he says in verse 26, but it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And what Jesus says is, you know what, I came here and I didn't come as a conquering king. I came and I'm serving other people. Did that benefit Jesus? No, it didn't. I mean, does it benefit to spend hours and hours and hours go without food, go without sleep, do fasting and all these things, die for the sins of the world? It didn't benefit him at all but it benefited other people. And see, our lives are meant not to be about us. The question is, how can we benefit other people? And I'll tell you what, when we develop this attitude to think that our lives are about us and we're meant to make ourselves happy and we're meant to be happy in our lives, what takes place is we end up being miserable. That's what takes place. If you look at depressed and miserable people, those are people that life is all about them. They end up being miserable. But if you do what the Bible says and serve other people and work hard and say, hey, I'm not doing it to get paid. I'm not doing it for a great reward. I'm doing it just because I want to work hard and help other people. What happens is you're happy. People look at our lives as soul winners people serving God, this is what 99% of the world thinks. You guys live a pretty depressing life. What do you do for fun? We knock on people's doors and ask them about Jesus. It's like, why would you do that? It sounds depressing. It doesn't sound like a lot of fun. And they don't get it that when you make your life about other people, it's like it's the greatest joy that you can have. Because what takes place is if you focus too much on yourself, the problem is none of us are really all that special. We think we are, but we make our lives about ourselves, and then all of a sudden you get this Solomon sort of feeling where it's like, man, I'm, I'm miserable because your whole life, I, I hated life because it's all about me. Now here's the thing, serving other people while you're doing it and it's difficult and it's hard, in that moment, sometimes you feel like, man, I just want to rest or relax. But when you get done, you're like, man, I'm really thankful I did that. Isn't that true? I mean, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes while I'm going soul winning, I'm not always enjoying it. You're tired. You're exhausted. We do these soul winning marathons, and it's a challenge to get to the end and keep going faithful. But here's the thing. Whenever you get done and you can walk back at the end of the day and say, hey, I gave eight people the gospel and three got saved, it's like you're excited. It's like, praise the Lord, I was able to give the gospel and get people saved. And you know what? You end up being very happy because you worked hard and your life was about other people instead of yourself. And this is why so many people get frustrated in life, whether it be, you know, husbands, wives, moms, dads, or whatever. They make their lives about them and they see all the things that they don't get to do and everything and they feel miserable. But if they would pour their heart and soul into other people, then they would realize, actually, you know what? This is what life's all about, about benefiting other people and not myself. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6. There are a lot of religions that basically teach this either directly or basically indirectly, where basically life is about being happy. And the biggest religion I can think of that is like that is Buddhism. Buddhism is all about being happy. Now, they don't do it in a way of like a sinful happy where just basically do drugs and everything like But basically they say, let's get rid of all suffering. Let's get rid of all fear. Let's get rid of all these things. And that way we can be happy. 
You say, what's the problem with that? The problem with it is it's a false philosophy, as I preached earlier, this idea that your life is about being happy. I do believe that if you serve God, you'll be happy. But if you make your life about being happy, you'll be miserable. If the only thing you ever do is just say, whatsoever my eyes desired, I kept not from them. You will be a miserable, miserable person just like Solomon. And you're going to realize one day, I hated life. And Solomon was wise enough to realize why, but I think a lot of people, they hate their lives, they're miserable, and they don't know why. And it's like, you know what? It's because you're making your life about you. What's funny about that religion, Buddhism, it's the religion that basically wants to be happy and get rid of suffering and all these things. It's the religion that focuses completely on yourself. You, you can't find a more miserable religion. You're going to make yourself miserable. I mean, the Buddha, the famous Buddha, leaves his wife and his son and just leaves the family. You know what you call that? A derelict father. You call that a loser. A, a, a father who willingly became a homeless vagabond in order to basically search for his own enlightenment. What do you call that? You call it making your whole life about yourself. You know what's going to happen? You're going to be miserable. Why? When you focus on yourself, it makes you miserable. And yet, Jesus taught that if you focus on other people and help them out. I mean, the Bible says if you know these things, happier are you if you do them. But the direct context is, context is about serving other people in that chapter. And basically, when you serve other people and live for them, it is going to result in happiness. But if you search after happiness and just worry about yourself, you're going to be miserable. The exact opposite will end up happening which is why that's probably the most depressing religion in the world. And yet they're searching after happiness. Why? Because you're focusing on yourself. You're doing the exact opposite of what you need to do if you want to be happy. Go to your Bible to Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6, verse 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling. In singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. Not with eye service, it's, it's not really a common expression or way we would phrase it today, but the idea is, basically, you don't just work when eyes are upon you. But basically, you realize, my boss is the Lord. His eyes are always upon me, right? And most people in a secular job, what they'll do is they'll work hard if they're being watched. Or they'll work hard if they have to accomplish something where basically they're going to get credit or be checked at the end. But if they can get away with doing nothing and nobody sees and nobody knows, what are they going to do? They're going to be lazy. And what the Bible says is, as servants, even if you're not getting paid, not with eye service, but you're the servants of Christ. And from the heart, you want to obey what God says and do right. You just naturally want to work hard. You say, but I'm not getting credit. Well, not with eye service. You should be willing to work without getting any credits. You should be willing to work everywhere. You should be willing to work without getting any credits. Turn your Bible, well, to Ephesians 6, verse 7. You say, Brother Stucky, why would I want to do that, though? Work everywhere, work without getting credit. Number one, because God commands you. It's what the Bible says. Number two, it's going to make you happy. But number three, if, that's not, if those are not good enough reasons, which they should be, because you get wages. You get paid for the work you do. You say, Brother Sucky, I thought that you said you work without getting credit. No, no, no. Here's what I mean. You work without the mentality where I'm only going to do this if I get paid for it. But your boss is not your secular boss. Your boss is the Lord. And at the end of the day, God promises that in all work, there is profit. So here's the thing. You're not technically working without getting anything out of it. I mean, if you have five free minutes and you pick up some trash and throw it in the garbage can, why would I do that? What's the benefit for me? Well, actually, actually you will get benefit from it. Actually, you will because in all labor, there's profit. Now, that does not always mean a financial profit. 
I do believe many times God can bless you financially, but there's many things that are far import, more important than money. Far more important than money. But the bottom line is, in all labor there's profit. What it says in verse 7 is this. With good will doing service as the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. It's like, why would I work if the, the eyes of the boss are not upon me? Because of the fact you're going to receive of the Lord, the Bible says. You're going to receive of the Lord if you do it without doing it to get credit, but just working hard. God sees what you do. Even if you spend an extra hour that you didn't get paid for at your job, you will get paid for that. Eventually, you're going to get it. It might not be in, in a week. It might be six months down the road. You might never know because it's not in your paycheck. God's going to make sure that you get what you deserve. Or he's going to give you something more valuable than money. But make no mistake about it. You're going to get something. You're going to get a reward from God as a result. Go to Genesis 47. Genesis 47. I mean, sometimes we see things and we just, we, just, we just don't fully see the whole picture of how God can bless us and everything. And I think back to the job I had in Maryland for several years where, you know, based on the exact work I did, I was extremely underpaid because pretty much anywhere else in the United States, I would have made a lot more money. Some places twice as much money as I was making. But I, one of my requirements for where I was working or what company I work for is I got to be near a good church. And you know what? A lot of you can relate to that when you make that sort of, and you know, it could be the fact that, hey, I want to be at, at, with a job where I can actually work and be a part of church. Sometimes you make financial sacrifices when you do that. But I think back in my life and I can see the ways that God blessed me. One of the ways is the surgery I had on my knee, I, I ran into this stipulation where basically I didn't have surgery immediately. And then I was worried it would not be covered because it would be listed under a pre-existing condition. And depending on what company you have and what their insurance is, it might not be covered. And the new company I went to, because basically I transitioned to a different job, it's like I was in a difficult situation. It's like, great, I have a torn ACL, but it's, I'm at a different job now. But in, in most situations, that's not going to be paid. But even though I didn't get paid a ton of money compared to other jobs, and look, my needs were provided. I'm not complaining or whatever. I mean, I, I made money to provide my needs. I'm just saying in other locations, I would have made more. But even though I didn't make as much money, under the insurance plan, every cent was covered for my surgery. Whereas in other companies, it would have cost me out of pocket $50,000. I just wouldn't have had the surgery. I would have like, I'll have to live with this because I'm not going to pay that much money. I can't pay that much money. And so even though I didn't get paid as much as I would at other companies for the work I was doing, well, I got saved $50,000, right? So it's like, what a blessing that is. And I can think back to where basically, you know, I made sacrifices to decide to go in the ministry where basically said, I'm throwing my career away because I got to get trained for the ministry. I want to go to a church where I can be trained to be a pastor. And you know, those are financial sacrifices. And yet I look at the timing of when we bought and sold our house and things such as that. And God just worked things out where it's like, we have very much been taken care of. And it's just like, it, it, there's just something about when you serve God, God takes care of you. You know what I mean? I'm not saying, and look, my family, we're not rich, and I'm not saying you're going to be rich, but you know what? God provides the needs of those that work hard and love him. It's just the way it works out. Things just happen to work out. And you know, you can't always put your finger on it, but if you really stop and think about it and realize what the Bible says, what you'll see is people that love God and work hard, God will provide for them. Genesis 47, verse 5. And Pharaoh spake unto Joseph, saying, Thy father and thy brethren are come unto thee. The land of Egypt is before thee, and the best of the land make thy father and brethren to dwell. In the land of Goshen let them dwell. And if thou knowest any men of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. And what Pharaoh says is, you know what? Joseph, here are the people I want to be the rulers. Those that work hard. Those that are men of activity. This is something I've, I've learned in the ministry. And it was something I was told ahead of time, but something I relearned as I went into the ministry. And what I was told is that when you pick people for assignments, and this is especially as a church grows, people to volunteer and stuff, you don't necessarily pick the most talented person for the job. You pick the most faithful. Our natural inclination is to pick the most talented. 
it's not actually the right thing to do and sometimes you regret it and what i was told is basically that you know specifically with song leaders is what i was told because that's specifically something where you can see a sort of skill where basically certain people are very skilled at being song leaders but it's like many of the people that can be picked they don't end up being the most faithful or the people that you can really trust the most more important than being the most talented is actually being faithful actually that you do what is asked of you and look of course you know what it if people are leading the music, you want people that know what they're doing and you can grow in a, and, and, and develop in that ability. But the idea is, you know, you don't want to pick someone who's basically very talented, but they don't actually go with the program and just kind of do their own thing. You pick those that are faithful. And here it's not about ability. It's picking those that are men of activity, those that work hard. Go to Hebrews 11. We'll look at two more places. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, verse 6. Brother Stucky, what's the point of being a hard worker? Well, I mean, it's going to benefit you. You're going to actually accomplish something. You say, but what am I getting for it? I do something, but what does it do for me? Well, I mean, at the end of the day, you're actually going to get wages for it. But here's the thing. If you do it with the mentality, well, I'm going to do this because I want God to give me something. You might not get anything for it. <laughs> you got to do things with the right attitude. You say, Brother Stucky, I don't know about that. Does it really matter? No, the attitude matters because the Bible also talks about him making manifest the counsels of the heart. And if people say, I'm only going to go soul winning because I want to basically proclaim I get the most people saved at church, you probably lost your reward because you're just doing it to get credit from man. The attitude matters. And so here's the thing. You got to fix this on the heart and say, hey, I, I just want to work hard because there's something that needs to be done. It's like, I got the time, I might as well do something. I'm going to do what the Bible says. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. And look, this is something that desperately needs to be taught to young kids because you just see it with young kids. They don't naturally want to work hard. This is something that kids do not naturally do. I mean, you, you tell your kids, clean up the room. How much do they really clean it up if you're not watching what they do? They pick up like one thing or two things. They don't pick up everything. They don't make it spotless. And you gotta keep telling them. You gotta keep training them and telling them, no, 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 every single piece. You want them to get to the point where basically, if they're told to clean up the room, they look around, is there anything else that needs to be cleaned? Rather than having the attitude, what's the least I have to do where basically dad doesn't complain, doesn't get mad at me, right? Kids just naturally do not work hard. It's just the way it is. And of course, I, I think kids should be able to play and have fun, but we also need to have a proper balance. I don't think that we should just train our kids to act like kids till they're 18 and then say, okay, now get a real job. We need to get them to that point where they're working hard ahead of time. It says in Hebrews 11, verse six, but without faith, it is impossible to please him for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And if you want to please God, you're going to believe on him, but you're going to diligently seek him. Now, you don't have to please God to be saved. That's not synonymous. In fact, God is not pleased with everybody who is saved. If you, want to, if you want to please God, you must believe that he is. You must believe on him. But you also must diligently seek him. And I'll tell you what. Most Christians that are doing nothing for God, God's not pleased with them. He's not happy. I mean, think about it. If you had kids that did nothing, and didn't listen to you, didn't listen to anything you said. They disobeyed every single thing you said. Would you be pleased with them? No. Now they'd still be your children, but you're not pleased with them. You still love them, but you're not pleased with them. It's the same thing with God. If you believe on Jesus and you don't seek him and obey him and do what he says, God is not pleased with you. You say, well, why would I do this? So what's in it for me? He's a rewarder. That's what the Bible says. You get rewarded for the hard work you do. Look at verse number 24. Verse 24. Verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasure in Egypt, for he had respect under the recompense of the reward. Moses said, I'm willing to suffer in my life because there's a reward on the other side for my hard work. Here's the thing. Did Moses live an easy life? No, he did not. You know what would have been a lot easier? Staying in Egypt, being in royalty. 
I mean, I don't know if it is exactly like this, but this is what you always see in these old, you know, films or documentaries of Egypt. It's like they got these giant feathers and somebody, you know, to the rich people, they're basically just, what is it, pomai pie is what you say, like a giant pomai pie and, and just basically fanning you and everything and you're sitting there, they're bringing you a pineapple and you're just sitting there in your chair doing absolutely nothing. Now, I don't know if it's exactly like that, but I'm just saying Moses being basically brought up by royalty, he could have had a nice life and not had to work too hard. And yet he's in the wilderness and he's working himself ragged. I mean, it comes to the point where his father-in-law says, hey, what are you doing? It's like you're working day and night. You got to do things a little bit wiser because you're going to run yourself into the ground. And Moses was running himself into the ground for nothing, for other people. Why would he do that? Because he had respect and the recompense of the reward that he would get one day. Because he understood that, you know what, my hard work will benefit me. Even if I never see it in this lifetime, even if I never have that fancy car, fancy house, even if I don't have all the things that other people have, I realize I'm going to, at the very least, if not be rewarded here, get the rewards in heaven where it's going to be worth it. And, you know, I had this on my notes. We're not going to turn there. I think everyone's probably familiar with 1 Corinthians 3, where basically you stand before the judgment seat of Christ and the works that you do, you're going to get rewarded. But the idea is there that God is going to make manifest things that people are not aware of. Where basically you can do things and get no credit for it, nobody knows about it, and yet God says, you know what, I'm going to reward thee openly. I'm going to show the world all the great things that you did. So look, when it comes to working hard, you're never doing it for nothing. We should have the attitude, and we should teach our kids the attitude, we should be willing to work everywhere we go. If our hand finds something to do, we do it with thy might, even if it's not your responsibility, so to speak. We should be willing to work without getting credit. It's like, I'm not going to get paid for this. Who cares? Be willing to work without getting credit. But here's the thing. If you are willing to be a hard worker, even if you don't get credit and nobody knows about it, at the end of the day, God sees everything you do. And he is a rewarder to them that diligently seek him. You seek him with your heart. You dedicate your life to the Lord. You work hard. Dedicate your life to other people. God is going to reward you one day for your efforts. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing